You have also a stick now. You see? I have a stick, yes. Yeah, this uh, works, but uh, not so well. Yeah, it's done on purpose. It's a bit dim. Right? <coughs> okay, so I was asked to give a second presentation on the machine stu studies for the two colliders. So also on behalf of the co-coordinators. So I picked a few topics that came up in the last couple of months and which looks interesting. So first, one of the highlights of the last half a year or so is that we commissioned a tool together with a company from the UK, the Tunnel Optimization Tool, TOT, with this company Arab. And there's a web interface which is shown here. This allows you to to specify location, depth, rotation, slope, and the shape. <clears throat> and then uh, one can move the tunnel around and, and get the display like this, where one can see the depths and the different geological layers and optimize, try to minimize uh, the total depth of the access shafts and maximize uh, the location inside this, inside this molas layer and minimize the the length of the tunnel and other, other geological areas. And one can tilt it and move it up and down. Uh, and then one gets also this graphical display and with a color code indicating the, the difficulty, geological difficulty, etc. So input, input the CERN also, CE group also gave some input into this database for this code, uh, including these difficult regions. And the example was already shown. This is the example of a site study with a 93 kilometer circumference. <coughs> anyway, preliminary conclusions are that the 93 kilometer tunnel fits in the, to the geological situation really well and is actually better than a smaller ring size. And 100 kilometer tunnel is also compatible with the geological boundaries. And also, what's very nice is that it seems the LHG, the tunnel can be arranged such that the LHG could be used as an injector. This is very attractive because then we already have the entire injector complex available to inject into the new colloid. Also interesting for the crossing, uh, the crossing under the lake is a little bit of some importance because the, the depth at which we cross somehow determines the depth of the tunnel at other regions. So, you can see here there is also molas moraine and the uh, sediments and deep. There are three options studied and the uh, tunnel construction would be different. This would be an open shield tunnel boring machine through the molas. If you go some, I don't know, forgot 50 meters up or so, then we would go here through the moraine and we would need a different type of tunnel boring machine. And uh, then there's another option to uh, <coughs> of an immersed tube tunnel to, to, to sink these concrete elements into, uh, through the water onto the ground of, this, of the lake. But um, one goes through superficial sediments. So all, all options are studied. This, if one would choose this option, of course, uh, overall depths would be minimized. How deep? Hmm? How deep is this option? How deep? I think under the lake is not very very deep, I believe. Maybe 50 meters. Lake is, uh, lake there is 20 meters, not more Only than 20, that. but uh, unfortunately there's no scale here on this. Uh, maybe we can guess from here. I don't know. <coughs> yeah, but something is maybe not correct with the scale here. Maybe this is only a schematic. Because if this is 20 meters, then this would be only 60. This doesn't make sense. So I would say, guess that this is 50, 100, 150, something of this order. There must be, there's no scale here. Between these options? No. I'm sure that the, between the options, there's at least 50 meter difference between each of these options. Because we are talking of a depth between 300, or 200, or 300 meters. Hmm? 
It's not only 10 meters. No, no, there must be much more difference. Maybe in the first slide you have the scale. You have the first. This one? No, no, this here. Here? Scale. The leg is here. You see, okay, never mind. Uh, I'm surprised there's no scale. It would be nice to have a scale here, but okay. Anyway, this tunnel also there was there were lots of uh, quite some publicity and discussions around around this tool. So it was announced in several newspapers and magazines for engineers. And also, ILC community is quite interested, and they would like to they wanted to get this tool for their studies, which is a, a bit surprising because they already decided on their site and the, the tunnel location <laughs> seems. Uh, but it seems that actually FCC study is the first group uh, uh, which has produced such a tool for accelerator site optimization. And there will be presentation at IPAC. So based on this, uh, on this consideration and the geology, also a preliminary layout was produced for the FCC HH, which you can see here is a bit it's not a perfect circle, but it's a bit of a racetrack shape with two long straight sections, <coughs> which uh, each of these uh, is used to for collimation and the beam extraction. Actually, this needs more, uh, especially collimation needs a much l longer distance than the uh, experimental insertions, interestingly enough. And then we have uh, four experiments, one experiment here, and the other main experiment on the other side, and then there could be two special purpose experiments. So it actually looks very similar to the LHC layout. And then we have uh, the way the tunnel is configured. The LHC is somewhere here, tangential to this point here, and we can inject uh, on, either, on either side of this main experiment here. All these straight sections are 1.4 kilometer long. Only here we have 4.2 and 4.2 kilometers. shows you the collimation optics. The assumption, maybe very conservative assumption, is that uh, the gaps of the collimators and the beam sizes at the collimator locations are unchanged from the LHC. This means we need much larger beta functions. And uh, second assumption is that all the phase advances between collimators are the same as in the LHC. And it shows you here the LHC optics, which is I don't know, 500 meters long or so. And this is a scaled FCC optics with uh, 2.7 kilometer long. And uh, perfect, from the scaling, there's a perfect agreement in the, in the phase advances at the collimator. So you see perfect overlap. I think this has to be revised. It seems a bit strange that we need so much space for the collimation. But. Uh, anyway, so simultaneous or consistently with the consistent with this FCC HH layout, we have a FCC EE layout, and <coughs> also here two main at least two exper the experiments are located here, and there is a tendency or a trend towards two experiments from from some directions. So maybe that's something for you to discuss uh, if two experiments are sufficient or if really four are needed. And that most of the other straight sections are used to, uh, to host the uh, radio frequency uh, RF accelerating voltage. So everywhere with the RF uh, written, one can put RF. And for operation at the top, one could also consider to have additional short straight sections uh, in these points here to minimize the energy sources. Injection points, by the way, also the same as for the hardware machine. Okay, then I, let's have a closer look at the Hadron Collider. Here is again a comparison of more parameters for the LHC, high luminosity LHC and FCC HH. So the pileup in the baseline, the FCC HH luminosity, uh, I don't know, is it written anywhere? Maybe not. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's here. It's also 534, so the pileup is almost the same, just increase a little bit because of the higher cross section. 
and the other parameters were already mentioned. What's interesting is we have the high synchronization power of five megawatt, but we also have radiation damping, which is significant. Uh, the longitudinal damping time is half an hour compared with half a day at the LHC. So we have natural cooling mechanisms in this machine. If emittance is transversely and longitudinal, it get, gets small uh, rather quickly. Okay. One <coughs> important aspect is uh, at the high energy and high luminosity is the radiation impact, uh, radiation load of the final triplet quadruples and simulations were done by the Fluka team. You can see without shielding, without shielding, one has the left axis here and the units are in mega gray. So these are giga, giga gray uh, at the final, first final quadruple. Um, 3,000 mega gray after 3,000 inverse femtons. So with some shielding, 15 uh, millimeter tungsten shielding is in green, and then we have to use the right axis. In this case, the radiation, peak radiation goes below 50 mega gray at 3,000 inverse femtons, and this, uh, this seems to be uh, just okay. So with this shielding, one can survive 3,000 inverse femtons. Uh, the 50 millimeter shielding, but reduces, takes away some of the aperture, so this has some effect on the beta star reach of the collider. This has been studied for a 36 meter L star. It looks quite good, so if we tailor the aperture of, uh, if, we, if we vary the aperture of the final quadruples, we can even reach uh, 0.24 meter beta star, which is much smaller than the baseline of 1.1 uh, meter beta star. Okay, so as an aspect is the synchronization, how to handle the synchronization. The LHG has a beam screen inside the cold aperture. Here's a picture image of the beam screen, which has pumping slots, cool, cooling capillaries, and also some additional shields against electron cloud plus other features. And it has a 50 micron copper or 70 micron copper coating inside of the stainless steel screen in order to have a good impedance. Uh, and the, the LHC case, the beam screen is uh, at a temperature between 4.6 and 19 Kelvin or so. So for the FCC HH, the baseline is to start with a similar screen, but to operate it at a higher temperature in order to reduce, uh, to improve the cryogenic efficiency. As I will show you in a picture here. Too. Oh, also, also, the people are looking, the vacuum team is looking at some modification of the beam screen. Here is one example. Uh, here one starts with the LAC screen and then one has a continuous slot and a, and a V-shape uh, shield here, which is intended to, uh, <coughs> to scatter photons onto this, onto this shield-like shield object outside of the beam screen, which is directly attached to the cooling channels. This. So the ray tracing shows that it is indeed, it, it, uh, <coughs> it catches most of the photons and one has very few photons scattered inside the beam aperture. Uh, and uh, most of the heat here goes to these cooling channels. Okay, also overall cryogenic calculation is shown here. <coughs> this is a total power to, uh, at the refrigerator, refrigerator plant on the surface in watt per meter per beam as a function of the beam screen temperature. At the moment, we uh, prefer temperature of the beam screen is around 50 Kelvin, so it's much higher than the around 10 Kelvin for the LHC. And uh, <coughs> this is, you see this is relatively close to the minimum of the cooling curves. And there are different curves here, uh, which correspond to different synchronization heat loads. We should look at this light blue and at the red one for about 30 watt per meter. And this, in this upper curve, the magnets are at 1.9 Kelvin, and in the red curve, the magnets are at 4.5 K. So as you can see, if we, if we could operate narrow three tin magnets at 4.5 K and, and would operate the beam screen at 100 Kelvin, we would reduce the cryo plant power by another factor of two or so. So it would actually be the optimum. The only disadvantage is that then the resistivity of the copper coating increases and we have to see if the, if the instability rise times are acceptable and can be handled by feedback or not. Anyway, if we stay at 50 Kelvin, we need about 100 megawatt uh, refrigerator 
which is two and a half times, uh, I think, the present LHG cryo plant capacity. Okay, what's interesting, the very recent study is the luminosity goals and phases. This was triggered by a paper of Bert Richter, who argued that our baseline luminosity is much too low, and we should aim for much higher luminosity. So, um, we have considered what can be done. So, the general considerations are like this. That the initial luminosity of the FCCLH should be equal to the final HLHC luminosity. So this corresponds, as I said, to 5 to 34 uh, inverse centimeters square inverse second. Um, with 100, 125 days effective operation per year, this gives 3,000 inverse femtobahn over after three years. Uh, but the total luminosity should be in order of magnitude higher as our goal. And therefore, we propose two phases. The first, first phase is this one, and then there is a second phase where we increase luminosity by about a factor of five and get then an average of uh, 1,000 inverse femtobahn per year, or another 15 inverse atobahn over 15 years, which gives a total around 18 inverse atobahn after 25 years of operation. <laughs> this can be done. Actually, here are some examples of a luminosity evolution during a day. <coughs> the red curves are for phase one. It's very smooth running and not much variation. The run takes about 11 or 12 hours and the luminosity changes by less than a factor of two during a fill. And this red curve corresponds to the baseline, 1.1 meter beta star, and the tune shift is held constant at 0.01. So, <coughs> and then we have turn around. We have uh, almost two, two fills like this during a day. Um, radiation damping, by the way, would be very fast, but we have to, we have to counteract it and, and make some noise excitation in order to keep the beam tune shift constant and have this curve. In the phase two, we, can, we reduce beta star to 0.3 meter. We accept higher beam tune shifts, which LHG already demonstrated as possible. And in this case, we get, we get uh, this initial increase which is due to the very fast radiation damping, and then at this point we hit the beam beam limit of 0.03, and then the luminosity decays. And uh, in this phase two, we have about four fills per day. Yeah? Uh, uh, I don't know where it went, the microphone. So, so two comments here. The first one is that you argued earlier that the quadruples can survive three autobahns of total luminosity. This is 10 times as much. And the second is that <laughs> at uh, five times 10 to the 34, you have about 170 pile-up events in simultaneous interaction per band crossing. You have a factor of two more here. So how, how or, you know, five more. Five more. That is <coughs> yes. 500, 600, 700. Yeah, maybe 800, 900. Uh, so I think my, 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 my point is that, you know, there's, you know, you know, an interchange of requirements for the detectors also, and they need to be considered. I mean, it's one thing to drive the luminosity needs from the physics, but there's also then detector requirements and machine requirements. Yes. It's 25, but we can, the same plot is true if we use 5 nanoseconds, and then the pileup is five times lower. So I think the detector either has to accept higher pileup or uh, shorter bunch spacing. Otherwise, there is no way to go to the luminosity. So, uh, must, one must push one or the other parameter. Also radiation damage. Radiation damage, yeah. Either we have to exchange this last quadruple every, I don't know, one or two years in that case or we put more shielding. As you saw, the shielding is quite efficient. If we put a little bit more shielding, we can bring the radiation load further down. But then uh, we have to see how much we lose in beta star. But we, we have, this depends also on the L star, the, this free length to the IP. The plot, this calculation before it was for 36 meter. In principle, we are studying 40 meter and 25 meter. If we go to 25 meter, we have a lot more margin in the, uh, to reduce beta star and could put, in addition, uh, further shielding. I don't know, there's a trade-off, it's a, it's a good comment. We, we try to make everybody happy, but it seems that this luminosity goal 
last week we were in Colorado. It seems that more or less everybody agrees with the luminosity goal around 20 inverse autobus. That seems that all the particle physicists were happy with this goal. Hmm? Yes. The see, even the theorists were happy with that goal. Hmm? I'm sure theorists would be happy with the goal. What is the question is whether the experiments can work with the high luminosity LHC pileup rate uh, level, but with a rep rate of five nanoseconds. That's the the question. So let me say something. I think we should should be more ambitious, right? This is going to start in 50 years from now. I don't see any problem with a thousand pileup events. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's uh, Frank continue, man, huh? because um, okay, to show the integral luminosity. So here, in this case, actually, we have uh, almost ten inverse femtoban per day in the phase two. Okay, I, I added two slides for Michelangelo. He actually argued. He actually discussed the luminosity goals, and you can see that with one inverse autobahn, we can find a W prime, uh, discover W prime at 32 TeV, and if you go to 10 inverse autobahn, we can find a W prime at 39 TeV. And then if you go to 100 inverse autobahn, this one would go even up to 47 TeV. So basically, one gets 7 TeV energy reach for, for each factor 10 in luminosity. This he converted into a plot which looks like this. And then he said that at a 40 TeV, at 40 TeV W prime, the, the, there's only a 20% return for a factor 10 higher luminosity, and this is kind of saturation point, and it's not worth to go beyond this. So that somehow sets the scale of the 10 inverse autobahn as a good. But you also see that there is a much higher gain <coughs> at lower masses. So higher luminosity helps actually for studies at lower masses much more than for pushing the the energy reach. Anyway, then I turn to the lepton collider. This is a more general parameter list. This is the baseline. The baseline for the Z, W, H, and top, and also the Chinese design. And then there is an alternative version, which is a Krebs, so-called Krebs scheme, Italian scheme, proposed as an alternative for the running at the Z, which has much smaller emittance and much higher luminosity. A second. Okay, this is illustrated here. This is a luminosity based, this is a log scale, uh, 10 to the 34 up to 10 to the 37. And this is the sum, I think here is shown the, this, this luminosity summed over four IPs. Uh, this is a baseline, and this is an improved parameter set from Novosibir using crab waste and other and in a different optics and a larger crossing angle. You can see that at the Z, we, there's almost a factor 10 gain. There's a factor 3 gain also at the W, and there's an, or still some factor 1.5, <coughs> maybe almost factor 2 gain at the Higgs. So uh, parameters are improving. The luminosity are incredibly high in this machine. So this has been studied in beam, beam simulations by Dmitry Shatilov. Here's an example. This is a beam, beam simulation for at 120 GV for the Higgs factory operation mode. And with the crab waste, even here, even at the Higgs, with the crab waste, he obtains the 8, 10 to the 34. And with, with, a, with a crossing angle, it's only 5, 10 to the 34, and much larger tails in this. Amplitude space, but while, while the crab wave scheme basically excites no resonances and the beam is much more compact. And even at the top, uh, the beam looks healthiest in this crab wave scheme, actually. And luminosities here in this case are almost the same, but this, this scenario is still quite good. And uh, this is achieved here with a relaxed beta star, which is quite important. Here, the sensitivity to beta star is not so big. So with a two millimeter beta star, one gets the same luminosity as with one millimeter. So it's better to go to two millimeter because here we want a large momentum acceptance, and this is made easier by increasing the vertical beta star. Okay, then we also have op different optics versions. This is one of the uh, IR crab optics developed by Anton Bogomyakov from Novosibirsk. 
Um, this shows you the geometry. This thing is about 700 meters long. It has this funny fish shape, geometry, uh, shape, and uh, crab waste taxables could be implemented in these locations here. Hmm? I have a plot. I have a plot which shows the interaction region. Yeah, I think. Uh, actually, there are several plots, but but they might have changed in the meantime. But this is. Uh, Related plot which shows the synchrotron radiation for this for this beamline that I showed before, and this is a study from uh, Helmut and Manuela, uh, which shows this, uh, where the synchrotron radiation from all these these bending magnets goes, and there are some bands which emit synchrotron radiation in the direction of the collision point. So that would be uh, is a concern for the machine detector interface. And typical photon energies, average energies are around 350 kV, critical energy one MeV in the arc. And so, as for the, the presence, this system was deemed not to be completely adequate. So I think there has been an iteration, and the new system should have less synchrotron radiation towards the IR, I believe. Uh, in particular, maybe some of these bending magnets have to be weakened in order to reduce the radiation back on. Uh, good news is, for the first time, this IR optics was combined with the arc optics, and for the first time, uh, I think just maybe around Christmas, we had a closed optics for the entire ring. And <coughs> I only show you the chromatic functions. And here is a tune versus momentum offset. And uh, this tune looks healthy over a range from minus 2% to plus 2%. So this, this hints at the possibility to have a plus minus to momentum acceptance, which is our design goal at the 350 GB, where, where we are limited by beam strahlung the synchronization in the collision. And we would, at this energy, we need a 2% momentum acceptance. And it seems we are very close to this. OK, also IP layout. Here's a sketch from, from Telnov. I hope it's approximately correct. Uh, <coughs> I think we have a 2 meter L star from the IP. Is that true? To the first quadruple. He assumes um, solenoid field has not been determined. Uh, he assumes something between one and three Tesla at the IP, and then a compensating solenoid here. And then there is a screening solenoid around the first quadrupole. So assuming this type of layout, he, he Telnov computed emittance growth due to the disper dispersion and the solenoid field. Body solenoid field with cross angle and the fringe fields. And in the worst case, he found 100% emit vertical emittance growth. And in a good case, without any fringes, it's only 1%. So, so I think further optimization is underway to minimize this emittance growth due to the solenoids. OK, what's interesting, RF cavities. As I said, RF cavities are the key component of the FCCEE. <coughs> and the observed performance was summarized by Olivinas. <coughs> So typical gradients are actually not so high in high current cavities. Cornell, Caesar, and KKB, and also JLabs, TLS. The gradients are all between 6 and 10 megavolt per meter with high beam current. And in all cases, single cell cavities are used with highly damped HOM spectra. And we need, we need a very high current in the Z and W running. So Uli argues that we should not go for multi-cell cavities, but we could use two cell cavities because they have almost the same HOM spectra as a single cell. Because uh, second mode, each mode would be degenerate, but the second mode, the pi mode, is such that it doesn't couple to the beam. OK, so this is the argument for two cell cavities. And then using such cavities, a staging scenario is proposed. Uh, first of all, uh, it's assumed that one megawatt klystron drives eight cavity modules. And each, cavity mo each of these cavity modules consists of two two-cell cavities. So based on the, such a scenario, the commissioning stage would use 12 klystrons and eight, eight cryo modules per beam. And this commissioning scenario would already produce 5 10 to the 34 luminosity at the Z, and still almost 2 10 to the 34 at the W, but would not have enough voltage to go to the Higgs. The stage one would have twice the number of klystrons and would reach the Higgs with 10 to the 34 as the Higgs. And then stage two would double the number of klystrons and would give 4 10 to the 34 as the Higgs. 
and uh, 335 at the Z. And then finally, stage three would be a re reconfiguration where the cavities are shared. But here, here the cavities are separate for HB. Here they would be shared to maximize the voltage. And it, uh, this can only be done with, when the num if the number of bunches is not quite a, as high. So it's, this configuration is not useful for the Z running. But it allows, the maximum voltage allows operating at the TT bus threshold, and one would get then above 10 to 34 at the TT bus. This is quite attractive. We could also double the RF system, but by sharing the cavities, we save a lot of money. So this is a quite attractive scenario. So this is no crab waste and one IP? Right? This is no crab waste and is luminosity for one IP, yes. That's correct. As a logic, the idea was Repeat the question. Okay, so the question is, what is the logic behind? You have to stage when you, you want to test things first and you might want to do some more work in order to get to the next stage or there's not enough money. And you yes, I think the assumption was that, uh, that, uh, that you don't get all the money <coughs> immediately, perhaps. So you, you, in, you install, ca your cavities are the most, ex RF is the most expensive object. So you install some cavities when you have them and you run for a year and then you, you install the next sets. I think that's the assumption. Yeah, I, I think the other idea is that um, we could start commissioning the machine before the LEC finishes so that we don't run into a problem of having too much energy consumption. That uh, could be another idea, yes. Uh, uh, an early start before the end of high luminosity LEC. I like that explanation. <laughs> Frank, you have uh, two minutes. Okay. This shows you graphically the performance of the different stages. The blue curve is for the Z. It's commissioning stage, stage one, stage two, and then you have the W, you see the luminosity going up, then the Higgs, and the TT bar is only in the stage three. Anyway, it's, quite, it's a quite attractive scenario, perhaps. Also, this is how the energy sawtooth looks. If we have only two IPs uh, on the two opposite sides, then the energy of the center of mass energy will be exactly the same as these two IPs. Um, the, uh, the other two experiments, they would have somewhat asymmetric collisions with. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So one beam, one beam would have a higher energy and the other lower energy and vice versa at these other, at these other experimental points. So I'm confused now. Anyway, it's a small effect perhaps, but with two IPs, energies can be exactly identical. With, with four IPs, there's some difference in two, two of these IPs. Anyway, I'm almost finished. So how much is needed? I made this slide, which caused some consternation, but this shows, uh, center of mass energy, luminosity. This is the FCCEE baseline with two IPs, total luminosity. This is the, F the maximum we can ever hope to achieve at the moment, FCCE crab based with four IPs. And then the Chinese design at the moment has only number for the Higgs. I think they will have a, even have difficulties to get the same number at the Z, it might even go down. And the ILC upgrade is here, ILC baseline is down here. So uh, anyway, perhaps. <coughs> Can you repeat the question? Why is the Chinese not parallel to FCCE? Um, yeah, they, they have only one ring. They have only one ring, so I think they cannot increase the number of bunches as we do. Hmm? So the difference between the green point and the equivalent blue dots for, for FCC, that's purely the radius of the circle of the... I think it's mainly the, not entirely, but mainly the, the radius of the machine. Maybe Mike, Mike analyzed this. I think he, he found out that the Chinese could actually get somewhat higher luminosity. I think the main difference is, is radius of the ring, two experiments instead of four, and one beam pipe. 
one beam pipe means that you're limited when you run the Z, at the Z. Okay, that brings me to the conclusion. Oh, sorry, by the way, this gives you the inverse autobahn per year. So here in this lower range, you, you get astonishing luminosity values, I think. So I think I come to the conclusion, some, some conclusions. So I think work on both colliders is progressing well in international collaboration. And we have a closed optic solution, I think, for both colliders. And we have this tunnel optimization tool. It took a bit longer than expected, but it seems to be the first in the world for accelerator applications. And we have compatible ring layouts for HH and EE, which are also compatible with the LHC as injector. And the first thoughts on the vacuum system, on cryogenics, and on the SRF system. Okay, already mentioned that we can, it seems that from the tunneling tool, we can use the LHC as a hadron injector. And also, we saw that the performance potential is actually much better than the baseline for HH, the phase two, gets five times higher, five times higher luminosity because we can have a smaller beta star than assumed in the baseline and also there is margin in the beam tune shift. And for the EE, the crab base option can give a factor 10 higher luminosity at the Z. And of course, there is much, much more work to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. I wonder uh, if uh, there is uh, some uh, level of collaboration with the Chinese on, uh, on this uh, project. That is a good question. In fact, I, I've been, I visited China now three times in the last year because they have so many workshops and, semi and events and they had a mini review of their design. But on the other hand, they, they, they declined to, uh, to become a member of the FCC study. So, so I think at the moment, <laughs> the collaboration, there's a big question mark in the collaboration. Basically, they copy a lot of our design numbers and design ideas, and then they claim it's their idea. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I realize that the attitude is already very competitive. Uh, <laughs> for, exa for example, we now we have the FCC workshop in Washington, end of March. We have a workshop FCC week in Washington, and last week I heard that the Chinese have contacted the DOE because they also want to make a CEPC week in Washington. Now, this is completely crazy. <laughs> okay, I have another question. Uh, are you worried about the total power consumption of these machines? And, uh, and in any case, is that in any way, a, a, does it set some, some limits on the performance? Power consumption is a big concern for, for, for these machines, for both machines, also for the hardware machine. A first estimate, which I think was, was not correct, but a very crude extrapolation showed also multi hundred megawatt power consumption for the hardware collider. So I think we will, we will make, do a more careful evaluation. In 2018, we should know more precisely the. the the power consumption. For the lepton collider, we can easily reduce it. If we reduce the beam current, the number of bunches, we can easily reduce the power consumption. Probably at the moment, it's somewhere bit around 300 megawatt, perhaps. I guess somewhere, somewhere, maybe around 300 or a little bit higher. If we reduce the luminosity by factor two, we could probably reduce the power by factor two. This is, uh, and it's, still, it's still much higher luminosity than anybody else. How about increasing the efficiency of the RF instead of yes. reducing the luminosity? Yes, sir. We already, but we already we assume uh, good efficiency. But of course, RF efficiency is a is a main R and D item for the left one. Could I? So I, I have two comments. One is uh, I want you to take seriously what Frank said in the beginning about the, the feeling to have only two instead of four experiments. I think we should make the case for four experiments, very loud. And the second comment is that uh, those of you that are interested in the, in the interaction region details, uh, I will give a presentation tomorrow morning that would uh, show the, uh, the latest and greatest from what show Frank showed today. Very good. 
to, <coughs> to balance on what uh, Mike just said, <coughs> we, we have a physics program with four experiments that we barely touch. I mean, we, we are just at the limit uh, of doing it with four experiments. If with two experiments we can have twice more time, that's okay as well. <laughs> and I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I was arguing for four, but I see a tendency, a strong push towards two experiments. I can't take. I see a strong push from the coordination side or from, I don't know, from somewhere. <laughs> May. Maybe, maybe Alan can comment on no, this. I, I, th I think when you show the map of the uh, ring, you see two obvious locations, which are the... Um, and then there's two less obvious locations, which are the two points uh, next to the... Uh, opposite to sun, right? Uh, which also would work, except that the uh, bunch strains have to be twice as many and twice shorter. Um, it is or I think the design will be made for two, and uh, the basic baseline design will be made for two uh, collision points, and then there will be two optional collision points for which the price will be given. And so uh, that will give us uh, uh, some sort of measure of the price of experiments above two. Now, you can also make the addition right away and give the price for four. Um, I think it's a matter of presentation. If the price of the detector is the major part of the... Uh, no, 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 that's correct. That's correct. The question is, the people are challenging the fact that there will be four collaborations wanting to make experiments on this machine, and it's up to us to show that it is the case. The, la the last three e plus e minus circular colliders that we had, which is uh, Petra, Tristan, and Lep, had four collaborations with people happily working together. Yes, yes, but one of our colleagues who is now working on this configuration, he worked on PEP2, and he said one I experiment was, was good enough. <laughs> it's not possible to have more than one on PEP2 or, or super kick beam. So. Anyway, I think, I think we'll keep pushing back on this one. Well, there's no physics so argument. Okay, discussion where there is no counterpart here. I have no argument. I didn't argue for two IPs. I argued for four, but I see a trend towards two IPs. So I'm just telling you that. Uh, How is it explained by your boss? He likes two IPs. Hadrons. <laughs> My boss likes two IPs. Why? <laughs> Uh, be before the topic, which is about transverse collaboration, I want to comment about uh, the collaboration with the Chinese uh, counterparts. A few of us were there in Hong Kong a couple of weeks ago, and there is clearly a strong wish from their part to collaborate if we give ideas, uh, I mean, having in mind that, in a way, the central laboratory is there. I mean, they said very clearly that they do not want to have a world laboratory because they said that this was the wrong path for the ILC. Then they want to sell CEPC and ILC as a single package for now. And I mean, uh, then there is a strong wish from their part to have people involved, and they have been even asked to sign their conceptual TDR and even offer the Chinese name. I was offered a Chinese name, but also others. <laughs> so I mean, there is, I mean, there, 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 is a, 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 there are a lot of communication. I think on the other side, people are coming and so on. So. so I think. And the, the, the two projects, they, they have been compared rather, I mean, in, in, in details, I would say, there. In fact, one of the points that we discussed over there was that with the FCCE, we can achieve transverse polarization, which is something very important, even at the W. And this is a clear difference between the two machines, and it is difficult to have them with 50 kilometers. Is there any programs, uh, progress in that? I mean, about, I mean are there, uh, uh, is there any development concerning the wigglers or the tools to achieve uh, stronger transverse polarization? Because this will be something which will be important for the physics. You mean for our machine or for the Chinese machine? Bravo. 
uh, I learned and, and Mike are working on the polarization, but I thought we would get it almost for free with non-colliding bunches. No? There was a talk in the last workshop, right? There's no news on that. So from what we can see, we don't see any real major problem for having real polarization at the Z and at the W. Okay, what, uh, what I presented last time was how to keep the errors very, very low. So I think we, we are confident somehow. Th there's going to be um, um, a note pretty soon on polarization. Another big difference is that the Chinese collider cannot go to the top. So in case ILC will not come and we will have only the Chinese collider, there will be no measurements at the, at the top. Okay, my, I remember very well when Yi Fang came to the SPC and explained that he was going to 250 GeV with 50 kilometers. And he was asked, why don't you want to go to 70 kilometers and do the top quark? And he said, I do not want to upset anybody. Okay, so it's clearly a political statement. That is, if there is no ILC, they will go to the top if they need to. That's the basic, I think that's the basic, uh, um, you know, tactics, if you wish. Maybe, but they also said that the present circumference of 54 kilometers is the maximum that they can put in the, into the budget that, that, they, that they have available. Okay, look, I, I mean, we, we are... Uh, it's very nice for this discussion at the, tonight at dinner or uh, in another moment. Uh, so let's continue with the program. Let's thank Frank again.